So the first question is just pretty general. What languages do you speak, and how did you become interested in the field of language learning and biblical education? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I think the question of how, lang how many languages you speak is kind of it's nice, but it's not a criteria of what we do in this field. I think uh, the num I mean, it's, I think the way we look at it today is that we talk a number of languages. We know a little bit of each one, but if you ask me, can I speak the language? Not necessarily. I mean, you could say, I think in this age, this age, then when we, when we talk talk about um, the full linguistic repertoire. I don't know if you heard that term. But full linguistic repertoire means that people know a number of languages. They don't know them evenly. Some language you can know really well. Some language you know half of it. I'll give you an example. My grandparents spoke Yiddish at home. So I kept, and we lived in the same home, and I heard Yiddish all my life, you know, until I was 20 or so. And if you asked me before, I'd say, no, I don't know any Yiddish. I can't speak Yiddish because I never spoke it. But I thought, then I realized a few years ago, I went to a conference, and the whole conversation was in Yiddish. And there was lecture, lecture about language policy. And then I said, I, I'm sitting there for like three days, and I understand every talk they said, every talk I could really follow, especially since it was on language issues and language maintenance and language revival, but I could follow everything. And I was shocked. I said, what? But I always thought, I don't, understand. I don't know Yiddish, you know. Of course, I cannot speak it well, but it doesn't mean I don't know Yiddish. So I think the whole idea of the word speak here is problematic, because we know many languages in different ways. And I think what we're talking today about is, when I said the full language repertoire, there are lots of languages we know a little bit. Another language I know is German, and no, I know, I wouldn't even count it a few years ago, but because it's close to Yiddish, and because my mother and my mother-in-law was speaking, speaking German, and I went to Germany many times. I really understand German very well, and I can even talk it a little bit. So, of course, I, I will put German in my language repertoire. I would talk, put Yiddish in my language repertoire. I certainly will put French in my language repertoire because we learned it in school, and I still don't know much about French at all, but enough to understand something in French. So, and clearly English and clearly Hebrew. And so I think the question we have, it's like the kind of question we get about how many languages you speak, it's kind of, when you say on a, in a cat taxi or somebody say, oh, what do you do? I work in applied linguistics. How many languages do you speak? The first thing, I don't speak about languages necessarily to know, to know, because to know is so much, so much more complicated than just um, knowing all languages on the same level. So we use languages in so many different ways and therefore I think this question, if I hope in the future people will ask, what's your language repertoire? And I would say, I know this for that, and I know this for that, and this I can follow, this can I only understand the gestures. So I think we have to think differently about the question of how many languages do we know. So that's my, my answer <laughs> to, to you in terms of uh, uh, how many languages. I think in a way, it's, I mean, actually it's a wrong question, but I think, I hope that's the kind of question we won't ask in the future, but all ask more about the kind of thing we can do with different languages. Now in terms of how I got interested, because I think growing up in Israel, and I can show you I have a PowerPoint on that, growing up in Israel, where people came with many languages to Israel, everybody, every grandparent spoke another language, and um, parents too sometimes, and they moved to Israel, and people, they would come to Israel and people would tell them, that's not a good language, the language you know, because you have to learn Hebrew, and that's the only language that counts. It's very similar to what happens in America. You come here as an immigrant, or even if your parents, you're not an immigrant, your great grandparents were immigrants, and they speak a number of languages at home, and you come to school and they tell you right away, no, this is the wrong language. And I always show it with a picture where I show, I come with two, two eyes, and then one day I come to a country and they say, X, one eye, forget about the language you knew before, you have to learn a new language now. And it erases everything. So I hope, and this relates to the full language repertoire, I hope that people will think of languages as additive. Because what happens if, apropos of the first half of the first question, is that if you talk how many languages, so you end up knowing a number of languages, and after a while you know one language, which is English. Because kids who are born into English, they're still little, but they, uh, they learn English, 
especially with our first and second grade, and as time goes by, they forget all the languages they knew or all the languages that their parents spoke. This is why we're talking today about heritage languages. We're making everything in order to keep what we know. But so I witnessed that. I witnessed a situation in, at home where everybody, my father came, he spoke English really well. He, had, he told him, no, English is not good. He came from America. You have to learn Hebrew. And I'm interested in victims of language. This is my, my main area, and I'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow. And the point is, like, he came in the age of, let's say, 40 when he moved to Israel. He was not able to learn Hebrew. It was too late. There was no teachers to teach him. So he ended up being illiterate. Plus the fact that if you didn't know Hebrew, people looked bad at you. It's like in America, you don't speak English? What do you mean? You've been here for 10 years and you still don't speak English? People don't understand how difficult it is to learn a language. And in some of the data I'll show you tomorrow, you'll see how long it can take to learn a language. You know, 11 years, at least if you go to school even. So I witnessed at home my grandmother who spoke Yiddish and could learn Hebrew because, because of all kinds of reasons. She could learn Hebrew. She had nobody to talk to in many ways. Then, uh, and she felt like she's a no person, none person which is awful, awful, and Yiddish is a Jewish language, but still they, it was erased, and Israel had no respect. Only the language that had to be revived, Hebrew, was the language that got respect. And think about it, it's a whole country where nobody spoke Hebrew before. A whole country had to learn a second language. It's unbelievable, but excuse me, to even imagine a situation like that. And okay, and if you couldn't do it, you're a victim, you're a loser. So one of the things I'm saying is that uh, in my home, I saw two losers, my grandmother and my, gra and my father. On the other hand, I saw two winners, which is my mother. She came to Israel when she was younger. Her parents sent her to a private teacher to, to be tutored. I saw my grandfather, who was uh, the mayor of the town, and he managed somehow, we always spoke Yiddish at home, but he managed to go out in the public and pretend as if he knows Hebrew. Also, men could learn Hebrew much better because they knew how to read, and reading means that they always read in Hebrew the, the Jewish texts. So to move to oral language was easier. So I saw two losers and two winners, and I'm very interested in this situation. So for many years, I'm interested in this situation. How come my mother-in-law lived in Israel for 50 years and her repertoire in Hebrew was like maybe 20 words? How is it that something like this happens and nobody cares and she couldn't function? My father couldn't get a job. My I mean, isolated from the world. So this is where I come from. And I don't come from a point of a successful, this is why I said before, the successful language learner. I come to the point with the people, the victims of language learning, those who couldn't, even if they wanted to, learn a language, learn Hebrew for some reason. So. In terms of, this is why I, I got interested in language learning, or in problems with people don't learn, learn, learn language. And bilingual, of course, I don't talk about bilingual anymore, multilingual, even the center is called multilingual. And I think to think about how people maintain languages, and how come if they maintain languages, we still ask them the question, how many languages? You know what I mean? Because usually the policy, and this is why I was interested in policy more, Policy is really to kill every language, which is horrible. And what do you do in schools when you can't function in schools? So I think this is why I'm very much for multilingualism. I think that we should give credit to what people know. Okay? Thank you. I mean, you already touched upon this a little bit, but um, can you sort of explain what can be understood under the term linguistic landscape um, okay. and why it's especially interested, interesting to study this in Israel? Yeah, I think not just in Israel, by the way, because even in monolingual countries, kind of, kind of like America, Finland, you have also variety. People still put, even if you come to Long Island, then you see people, there are lots of signs, they're all in English. But if you, you can still analyze the language. It's language in public space. Still, it's language in public space. So I don't think we should limit linguistic landscape, which I gave to talk about, to multilingualism. I mean, our interest, because of what we do, is multilingualism. But, for example, if you see a sign where it turns only to a man and not to a woman, or you see signs like we saw in Colombia of a woman is being portrayed in a very sexual way, and a man doesn't, you know, this is, and, and it says if you, there are writings there in English or in Hebrew, 
or, and whatever in English or uh, in Spanish in Colombia. So the idea is that we we can do analysis of language and public space in L1 to in one language. But in my case, and I'm sure of you, because we work on multilingualism, we are very interested in how languages get translated, how they get and how they translate it in the public space, because the public space is a different domain because it has to do with how I portray myself, how I portray women, how I portray in different languages. And sometimes we see that lots of work we see in linguistic landscape, yes, one, one way of saying it in, 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 let's say, Amharic in Ethiopia, and one other way of saying it in English. So in English, the idea is, oh, I want to appeal to, West, to the West. And I, in the local, uh, in Amharic, it's I want to, appeal to the local people. So I think what we are interested in now is not just to see which languages are in the public space, but how does the message get translated or manifested in each one of those languages. And especially, as you know, what I'm interested in is how certain languages get erased from the public space. And this is what I'm trying to, especially with heritage learners, People will say, why should I learn heritage language if nobody gives attention to it? You walk around, it's only English. But in Koreatown or in Chinatown, you will see some of those languages. I was in uh, Atlanta a few weeks ago, and I was shocked to hear Atlanta seems to me to be very English-oriented and monolingual. Wow, there's an area, I don't remember the name of it, but a whole strip where you have all these languages, like from Korea, uh, Korean, to Chinese, to English, to Russian. So I think what I, and I, I can understand what it means to people who move here, move to a country, and they still continue to create their own language. It doesn't mean they don't learn English. It's still, it, but, but they can feel at least that they're welcomed in some way and function in that language. I would have been very happy had my grandmother that we mentioned before could have spoken Yiddish and should go somewhere and look for Yiddish, or my grand, or my mother-in-law, who, well, she couldn't find any friends who spoke German, especially after the war, it wasn't like, but she couldn't find people, but I wish there would be spaces. So this is why I'm interested in linguistic landscape. Besides, I'm very interested in political issues, and I'm very interested in how things get contested. That's why, how things get protested because I believe very much in the power of people, like all of you as students, and I believe people should be activists when it comes to language, and we should have a role, as I said today, in designing the public space. When I showed you in, this, in the talk one, how the city of Tel Aviv created the public space, and then how people objected to it, and they said, who is not included? Why are we not included? And they took action. And I think without action, it won't happen. Because linguists, as much as they care about it, linguists, they don't care so much about, linguists, linguists care about how languages work, you know? And people in, in our field in ling applied linguistics should work more on, on protesting, on creating more equal spaces. So this is why I'm interested in linguistic landscape. So, and there are many more reasons, but by and large, I think it's a, a form of activism and giving rights to people who don't have rights. Like I showed you the example of Arabic and other examples I showed today. I think it's very important that we open up the spaces to more, more groups and show that they can exercise. They shouldn't be ashamed of their language. Could you give an example of how language can be important for peacemaking on the sort of community level that you're yeah. referring to? Okay, that's kind of very, that's an interesting question, I think. Uh, and by the way, what I want to say, so I'm not talking only about Israel linguistic landscape. I think in Israel it's especially important because we have immigrants from so many places in the world. And what people do is they mono homogenize their language, all Hebrew, all Hebrew, and killing all the other languages, right? We said. But I think in, it's not just in, there's not a country in the world which is not an immigrant country or doesn't have different groups who live there and speak different languages. This is a given today. Okay, so now the question was about, um, um, say it again, a peacemaking. Okay. Yeah, just if you could give yeah, an example. Okay, I don't know. I, I, there are a number of levels, I think, in terms of peacemaking, because I think on one hand, 
we say, okay, we can each talk the language of the other. If like Israeli Jews will learn Arabic, right? So we'll be able to talk to one another. And the, the Arabs learn Hebrew anyway, because that's the only language that they can function going to university and so on. And it's a power language. It's kind of being here and not learning English. You have to also learn. But they're trilingual. They speak Hebrew, English, Arabic, Arabic first. And I think in peacemaking, I would say the situation now that only Arabs have to learn Hebrew and Jews don't have to learn Arabic is not against peacemaking because it's not equal. And I would say that in countries where we have big minorities, we have 20% Arabs, 20% Russian speakers, and here so many percent of, his, of Spanish speakers, we have to be in a situation where the space is much more equally distributed and in this situation, if I'm sure, if I, you saw the reactions of the students today when they didn't see Arabic enough in the public space. So I said, why? If they saw Arabic, it would make me feel better. So the feeling of better, feeling uh, by, by, through language, the feeling of better means also that you are, you can talk equally and you cannot do peace not equally. So I think that's one reason. Another reason we found a study that we did in 2004, I think, it's published in Modern Language Journal, where we saw that Israeli kids who are learning Arabic in school, even for one week, I don't know, a short time, whenever they talked, um, whenever they um, talked about Arabs after learning Arabic was very, very different than those who were studying French. They were talking about Arab people, I mean, Arabs in a more equal way, in a more respectful way. Because like this, I mean, we, show, we saw even an exhibit here in the center, in the Hong Center? Hong Center. Hong Center. And then there is um, there's a situation where um, uh, Ar Arabs are being discriminated against. So the situation of creating these equal conditions can have an effect on what you think about uh, the other. And in this study, these are kids seventh grade, and in that study they end up talking about the other in a very different way. So I'm not saying it's always guaranteed, but I think learning and tasting the language already puts you in a situation where you think differently about the others. You think of them as human being and not just as global entity or national entities. So I think that. So I think in terms of both attitude, what you think about the others, so that can be very helpful. I also think I wish there were more schools which are mixed. You don't have it here, but in Israel we have Arab kids in one school, a whole different school system, and Jews in school system. So they don't see each other. The only time they see each other is when they come to university, like in my classes, and they sit like you're sitting here with from different languages, and they sit together, and it's the first time for many of them that they create contact, and good contact. So they think about the others as people. So I think in that respect, uh, sitting next to another, not even knowing the language, but sitting the physical geography, I'm mean, sitting next to one another can have an effect on what you think about the other. So I think languages can be, some of the problems sometimes with languages when you try to translate, sometimes they, it works well when you try to talk in peace negotiations in English, even, in another language, which is more neutral, supposedly neutral. But I think language basically can, play a role in schools, as I said, in schools and learning the language of the other, and um, also in attitudes, as, as I said, and also in linguistic landscape to kind of make the space more equal, that will show more respect, and I believe that you can only create peace if you have equality. So this doesn't mean that sometimes um, peace can bring equality, that's true, but I think peace is a more difficult thing to reach. But there are many more things, but language is part of that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to take it in a little bit of a different um, direction. So every speaker, as you said, um, every speaker who is multilingual is so in a different way. Yeah. And we have all these tests to try to assess right, yeah. people's speaking skills. Yeah. But how do you assess the differences, these individual differences between people? Okay. I would say every individual, regard, even in the L1, we speak differently. I'm sure the two of you, I don't know where your background is, 
but the two of you certainly speak your English in different ways. I think every person has private language. Like how come when you call your friend, she right away knows it's you, right? What is it? Because languages are like faces. I mean, I won't say that I want everybody to have the same face. It's obviously not possible, right? But in language, we kind of think that people should have the same language, even in L1, which is so, so wrong, I think, because we are unique. I speak faster, she speaks slower, I speak with an accent, she doesn't. She, I mean, there are many, many differences. And I think the number one mistake of tests to begin with is that they want everybody to be the same, to everybody to react the same, which even in L1 doesn't work. So I think the whole idea of test to normalize people is a terrible idea, that I should know exactly what you know, just because we went to that school. And on national tests like the No Child Left Behind or the Common Core, we should all be the same. This is so bad. And I think when it comes to tests for immigrants, let alone it's bad, for sure. So I think in terms of um, individual tests, how, do we, how we assess the individuality, I think, first of all, there are certain things we should never pay attention to, like accent, grammar. I think we should not even, because of course, for the rest of my life, there will be words that I will never be able to say in English because I'm not a native speaker. And so, so never, I, and I don't want to have it. I think we are in a situation today where, in many countries, people who are out of the country, who moved to the country, who immigrated, feel very confident on the kind of language they speak. Um, you know about the ELF, the English lingua franca? Yeah, so English lingua franca is a combination of your L1 and your and English, right? And if you have two other languages, maybe the Korean with English, maybe Hebrew with English, can be anything. So I think we are not, we don't speak now anymore the same language. So the way to look at it from a, te from a testing point of view is really to say, to find out what you can do in the language. I can write a letter. Of course, it's not the same letter as somebody would make, but I don't want it to be. I think we have so much education to make, to, to, to do, in order to uh, convince a boss in a, in a factory or in a, in, a, in, a, in a computer corporation to accept me if I speak with errors, with, if I write with errors, sorry. Because the idea is that, you know, I don't write like you do. This is what it means. I write like the way I do. So I think the whole idea of co language correctness is problematic because we're talking about, I want to see whether you can be very good uh, worker in IBM in doing whatever you know you need to do that. To, there, sometimes it's to read, so you may do it, read with somebody else in groups or whatever. But I think we have very individual kind of um, knowledge in, in, in languages in general. So in terms of, so how, what was the question? Um, this question? No, this one, yeah. The, um, yeah, so how, how do you, do you assess, assess it? So I'm saying everybody has to show what they know. And the point is how to judge it. Whether what you know is enough that you can perform or no. And we have to do lots of education in terms of telling people in the business world that it's never going to be the same you may not, I mean, we have those wrong notions that accuracy, language accuracy, is the it. That's the maximum. And I have to, we have to sh show them here, like a person who works, has an accent, and still functions. Like, how come I speak and still? Because somebody was convinced that even though, but maybe 20 years ago I wouldn't be invited because of my accent. So I think it's a whole change in revolution that we have to make of what is considered good functional literacy or multiliteracy. So this is what I would say. So of course people have different languages, but the question is what we accept is okay. So I guess what you're saying about that you wouldn't have been invited maybe 20 years ago, right. so that also shows that now there's such a thing as global mobility. Mm -hmm. So this sort of perfect exactly. proficiency is no longer so exactly. important. But, but people I mean, didn't buy it yet. So then we still do the language test for what? Oh, we do the language test, that's a good question, because in schools, I don't know why, I think they do it, like now, why are they doing it? I, I just heard a paper in Chicago last week about how awful it is in some of the schools of Chicago, because, you know, not only do they penalize the teachers today, the students don't do well, and, but they want to find out how the schools is doing. So, you know what, they end up closing all those horrible schools, bad schools. What do you mean bad schools? Schools that are poor, 
schools where the parents, you know, come from different backgrounds. I mean, these are the schools that get closed. So you have kids who, whose schools, which is everything, they, this is the center, the point of court, and they are being dismantled. So I think, look at the kind of what they talk about, what, what Bush was talking in Obama. It's about to show, supposedly, it's to show who, who is not functioning as they should function. But I think this test, it's obvious that they don't function, you know. These, it's schools in bad neighborhood don't function. Why do you have to do tests? I don't understand why. So I think there is a message behind it. It's a racist message because you know to begin with that in certain areas where you have different races and different population, they will not do well. So I think it's competition. It's very, I don't want to say, but I think it's very masculine competition about who is the best, kind of. Because what happens? Obama, somebody was saying it in Chicago, Obama doesn't send his kids to public school, right? His kids don't go to private school, and that it means that somebody was saying it. So he opted out of those tests. Because private schools don't have to take those tests. So I think the idea of accountability is important. But you don't have to do no child left behind no common core to know that schools in difficult neighborhoods are problematic. Invest in the neighborhoods and in other in afternoon school uh, uh, programs and so on, and then you don't even have to do the tests. And of course, universities, because they don't have room for everybody, and you give, they give you the same test. But the test is based on what they think is the criteria. And it doesn't necessarily reflect me. So I think we are, the whole idea of testing is useless in my, in my view. It's good to have formative assessment that you actually um, go to school and people see whether you know what you learned and what you have to improve on this, but to have it in a big scale and to publish the results and to pinpoint those schools which are bad just because, like, you know, the international tests, I don't know, the PISA and those, those tests, which rank countries. This is the best country, this is the worst country. I mean, this is unbelievable that they can do it and get so much money and so many countries participate. Because if you don't participate, you'll be penalized and nobody will buy things from you because it, it affects the economy. So I think it's, in Ask Me, I think it's still very, it's criminal in some way to have these kind of systems that judge places, judge schools, judge people. So do you feel similarly about the concept of having an official language in a country or even in a community? Or do you it's related, it's related. And I want to say something which I'll say tomorrow before we go to this, and that is, uh, uh, I think what happens is with, um, with those tests here, example for us, which just relates to one of the questions before. If you have, you know many languages, do you get credit for that in any of those tests? Never. So. Us, we're talking here a full language repertoire. You just mentioned the mobile world. People are moving from one place to another. 20 years ago, I would have been invited or whatever. I think these kind of things don't ever get credited. All those things, are bit, so, and as long as something doesn't get credited, people may not abide for it, by it. So I think this is for us, and this is a talk tomorrow, is a lot about how testing companies knowing that there are different varieties and different languages and some are multilingual, some are not, are able to, um, to have those tests and ignore everything else we know. I think this is also problematic for immigrants and we care about immigrants or people, indigenous people who speak different languages. Nobody ever gives you credit for anything. So, and what we know is that many times kids who not speak a number of languages they do less good as some of the others because the total number of words they have is like, let's say, Korean plus English plus Chinese plus whatever other. So the language, you, your full repertoire is broader than one that tests can do. So I'm looking at my granddaughters and my daughter so, tries so hard to send them to, after, not have to, but private teachers to learn Hebrew when she speaks at home Hebrew. And you think in their school they go to, anybody pays attention to it? They don't even care about other things. And we're talking about language, too. And how come anything else doesn't get credited? So I hope we will have tests which will give us, which will give an advantage. Now what happens? I'll just say one more thing about it. I don't give officiality. One is now, if you speak one language, you're one language native, you're on top, right? 
you speak two languages or language with an accent or three, nobody gives you any credit, right, for that. I wish things would change, just go around. I think monolinguals should be penalized. Because how come they didn't make an effort to learn? And who knows, like, like you said, in this mobile world, maybe they'll need it tomorrow. They'll have better chances for jobs. So, okay, now in terms of officiality, see, I don't like the idea of official language. Although myself, we introduced an official language in Israel, official language in the schools in Israel in 96. I don't like the idea of number of languages. See, I don't mind that I say everyone in the country should know should be able to function in whatever way we can define it, like according to what I said at the beginning, one can understand, one language you have to only understand, one language you can create dialogue, one language you can write lectures, or whatever, Latin, you know, who needs Latin more than just to be able to read certain texts or something, I, I don't want to read Latin to prof full proficiency, what will I do with that, you know? But languages that I can really show that there is uses like that I go to a lecture room and I can understand what they say, or I can have a, whatever. But I'm saying we have, we should set, a, a, if we have officiality, we should really, I'm against having one of, um, official languages, even to the languages which are not, uh, not like kind of marginalized, indigenous language. I think we should really talk about knowing a number of languages and describe what you can do, but I don't want to ever specify which languages you should know. And I would give special incentives to people who speak rare languages, kind of, that, because otherwise, you know, people will probably go for the market languages, or go for Chinese like everybody's doing now. And they, you know, so I think we should encourage some other languages that people want to know if somebody wants to learn um, let's say, uh, Acadian, it's a language which nobody's used, but per person is interested, or they want to know, like we mentioned today, some version of Chinese of the past, fine. I mean, I think we should make sure that there is language repertoire in a country, you know, so that there are always people, you know, that need to know more languages. So I think basically we should limit, we shouldn't decide which languages, but we should have official languages on, um, we should have officiality only for the number of languages or proficiencies, what you should do in that. That's why I don't like the idea of a national language to begin with. Obviously we see what happens in America with English only and so on, but I work now, because we have to do now a new language policy as well, we are working on languages of communities. So if you think about the community I showed you today in Tel Aviv and Jaffa, there, I think there are certain areas there that I can actually say, okay, in this area there are so many people who come from Russia, I think that would be good to offer Russian in this neighborhood. Or in other areas it can be, oh, if you don't live, you speak Russian, you don't live in Russian, you don't live in the neighborhood, maybe you can be best or something. But I think we should not decide on one language, official or not, in the whole country, I think. This is what they're doing now, I and mean, in a way, in, with the Arabic, it's a Supreme Court decision, but nobody abides by it anyway, because the conflict is so big. So, as you could see today, the eraser, I think I showed you one, but the, yeah, the Arabic was erased. So I think, in, in, in just to conclude this, so I think officiality is problematic. Whatever you try to, like, think about South Africa, where Mandela brought in 11 languages, and there was still like, you know, 30% of the country was not counted in the 30, and in the 11 languages. So it's not working, basically. But the whole atmosphere, I mean, what, they, what Mandela did talk about is about um, uh, respect to languages, respect to diversity, which is fine. But you know what I think sometimes language, as much as language is powerful, when I was in South Africa and I could see um, the townships, and still you have colored living in one area, they call it colored, blacks living in other areas. You have so many such geographical divisions, so it's very difficult to think about coexistence of language when you have such divisions in this day and age. So I think language alone cannot do it. So you can give respect to languages, but you have to think of economy, jobs, housing, and other things signs in the public space and other things that will contribute 
to this way of existence, I don't want to call it coexistence, but existence among different groups, multi, multi-existence, sorry. But I think I'm personally against it, and we tried it, and it doesn't work, you know, this officiality. So English is not official, but everybody studies it. So there are other factors. So sometimes it's more important to have sort of a common language or a lingua franca rather than having an official language, per se? Oh, well, uh, maybe, yes. Maybe, yeah. I think English is a common, is an English lingua franca now in Israel. But yeah, sometimes people will go for that. People read the map. You don't need, this is why I'm saying, saying the official language thing. On one hand, for the power thing, they read the map. They know, oh, English is big. They read the map now with Chinese. Nobody had to say, learn Chinese. Everybody wants, but kids, the parents, oh, wow, my friend went to China to work. This one went, of course I want my child to know Chinese. You know, it's like, you, you can read the map really well. And they're very rational in that, parents. But I think there are some languages people will never learn. So I think, because they don't sell that well, and sometimes it's a language of our community, I think we should cultivate it with subsidies, with trips to the countries, and other things to kind of make kids realize it. And also to cultivate the idea of respect and, and multilingualism in the world. And, against this kind of losers or winners. I wish people who come as immigrants will be able to get more respect to what they know. So I think officiality per se, I don't think is a good solution. But um, but I know you probably will say that it's a, it's maybe a good idea for, for to protect some languages, probably. And I wonder how much of it it really materializes. We wanted to protect the right of Arabs. It didn't happen. But I'll give you one example. Language of instruction in school is crucial. And it's something we don't talk about at all. Like, what is the language of instruction in all universities in America, except one university in New York, where they teach in Spanish? It's all English. As long as we continue to have all the courses in one language, university, people get the message. They say, why should I need other languages? Now, you have lots of places now, in Europe, in Canada as well, where you have bilingual universities, multilingual universities. I think we should have more and more multilingual schools. Because schools are so important for most parents that if the school doesn't show, send a message of, wow, this is good to have, people will really hesitate before they apply this policy. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. More questions? <laughs> no.